bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Yes and amen, you will do great things, oh, God, you do great things. A hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great chain oh god you have done great things we take your freedom awaken alive oh jesus our savior your name is it i oh god you have done great things you have done great
I think it's kind of funny how Wes and I really became connected. We, like he said, we're, we're classmates together um, and out of nowhere. So I am, I'm naturally introverted by nature, okay? So um, yeah, I know I'm, I'm in front of a crowd, right? But I, I, I can communicate, right? But it's just, uh, if for me, Groups and crowds and, and extrovert, it just wears me out, right? I need time alone to refresh and, and re refresh my batteries. So um, with that, I'm going to Florida for school, and Wes texts me and says, hey, do you want a room together? And I was, I, I never do that. Like, that's, that's not my thing. I, was, I already had a two-bedroom Airbnb, Airbnb booked and was ready to go, and, and I said, okay, uh, I, I love Wes. I'll do it. And I went to my wife, and I said, honey, um, I'm in a room with Wes when I get to Florida. And she said, you're doing what? <laughs> she said, you don't, you don't do things like that. And I said, I, I know, but I just love him and I wanna get to know him. And I'm sure he's booked like an Airbnb. And I'm sure there's multiple rooms in there and I'm sure everything will be great. No, it was a studio hotel room with two queen beds right next to each other. I walked in and I was like, no way, this is crazy. And after a week, um, I loved him. After a week, I thought I, he became Uncle West to me. So uh, I love, he's a cheerleader, a friend, an apprentice, and I'm just, I'm super thankful to have him as a friend. I am from Texas, uh, north of Houston, about 40 miles um, in Huntsville, Texas. And I'm married, I have a beautiful wife, wonderful kids. I've got an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and an 18-month-old. Um, and yeah, they're a blast. Kids are all different, right? I mean, my eight-year-old is the most independent soul in the world. My six-year-old is the most needy soul in the world. And we're just lucky to know where our 18-month is at half the time. Like, we just, if we find them, great. If we don't, they'll come home when they're hungry. That's kind of how, when you have a full house of kids. So, um, why don't we do this? Before we get into Acts 21 and 22, I'll share with you a little bit about me, how I grew up, um, a little bit about uh, my background, and maybe it will give some context to where we'll head with Acts 21 and 22. I grew up actually in Kansas City, and I was, our family was super poor where we grew up. I mean, our first house was a trailer uh, with plywood floors and cats running around everywhere, and none of them were ours, right? Um, but we did have a pool. We had this, this like feeding trough that had water in it that when it rained, it filled up and we swam in it. We took baths in it. Parents would hit us with dish soap and we'd dip in and out. And that was, that was it for us, right? The, the crazy thing was we never realized we were poor. Like we had no concept that we had no money until my basketball coach at the end of our season invited us to a season ending pool party at his house. So we go to, and I'll never forget when we pulled up to his house, we go down his driveway and he had this giant house and, and this house had a house next to it that had all his cars and his toys and his boats and everything else. And then we get to the front door and he's got two front doors. Listen, you know you're balling when you got two front doors, right? So he's got two front doors, both doors open up. There's a spiral staircase leading upstairs. There's just marble floors. The house is beautiful. And then there's a pantry and his wife says, hey, uh, anything that you want, feel free to take it out of the pantry. You're our guest today. You don't tell poor kids to take whatever you want, right? <laughs> I was take candy bars in my pockets, gummies in my socks. I was taking everything I could, stocking up on this stuff. So we, we go through, we get to the backyard. They've got an in-ground pool. There's a diving board. There's a slide. It's beautiful. It's just, it's incredible to see. I'm swimming and I'm, I'm literally, as I'm swimming, I'm contemplating thoughts of adoption. I'm like, these people could take me in. I could have a good life here, right? And then I remember my mom showed back up and she said, honey, uh, party's over. It's time to come home. And I, I remember for the first time thinking to myself, I don't want to go back to that place. Don't take me back there, right? And she loads us up in the minivan. We arrive back at the trailer and we get there. And I remember getting in my bed and I remember saying to myself, one day I'm getting out of this place. One day I'm going to be rich. One day I'm going to change everything. And you know what's funny about that story is this. When we, when we catch a vision of what we can become, we're no longer satisfied with where we are. 
When you catch a vision of what you can become, you're no longer satisfied with where you are, but you are, you are inspired to a place where you're ready to become what you now have vision for, right? When we talk about the book of Acts and we move into the book of Acts, the book of Acts, is, it, it is people becoming the church empowered by the Holy Spirit to live and do the things of Jesus. It is, it is who we can become by the power of of the Holy Spirit. So you have the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four Gospels really tell the same story. It is the birth, the life, the teachings, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. At the end of the Gospels, Jesus says, and I promise you a helper, and the helper will come, and you will do greater things than the things that I'm doing by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So the book of Acts is the sequel to the Gospels. So the book of Acts comes, Acts chapter 2, Holy Spirit falls. Throughout the rest of the book of Acts, it is spirit-empowered ministry. It is, it is becoming the people of Jesus, living and doing the things of Jesus empowered by the Spirit. So Acts 21 and 22, where we're at tonight, we look at the, the, the whole book of Acts, we read through the lens of this. How does the Spirit empower me to live and do the things of Jesus? It's the whole lens of the book of Acts. So every time we walk through the book of Acts, we're asking ourselves, how does the Holy Spirit empower me to live and do the things that Jesus did? So as we read through Acts 21 and 22, that's the question we're asking ourselves. And to even personalize it to the chapters, here's what happens with Paul. When Paul arrives, he's leaving, uh, he's leaving the Ephesian elders and he's heading to Jerusalem, when he arrives in Jerusalem, he encounters people that hate him. They can't stand him. They don't want anything that he has to say. They don't want to hear anything that he's going to preach. They literally want nothing to do with him. So here's our question for tonight. I've, I've watched Brian and Wes, which is far better than just me alone, right? They are, they are a duo that makes it happen. I've watched them dialogue and, and ask questions. Here's our question tonight. How do we become, by the power of the Holy Spirit, how do we become people who live and do and reach and evangelize and minister at culture and other people who want nothing to do with what we have? That's the question. That's what Paul faces. Paul is empowered by the Spirit to do ministry among people that want nothing to do with him. So for us, our lens, how do we do the things that God has called us to do when nobody wants what we have? Acts 21 and Acts 22. Let's jump in. Where am I at? Okay, I got 10 minutes left. Here we go. All right. Here's where we'll start. And, and what I'll do, I'll summarize a lot of the story, and then I'll stop and read parts of the story um, and make a few connections to answer our question. How do we become people empowered by the Spirit to reach, evangelize, minister, love, connect with, and evangelize culture when they want nothing of what we have? Here is number one, um, Acts 21. So Paul starts out, I'll walk you through the first nine verses. He's, he's leaving the Ephesian elders. He's showing up in Jerusalem. He's in a hurry. He wants to get to Jerusalem before Pentecost, uh, before the party. He's trying to get there quickly. And as he's on his way, and Luke uses a Greek language in Acts 21, verse 1, uh, of pulling apart limbs. So he's saying literally when Paul was leaving, it was like limbs being pulled apart. These people loved Paul, and he's going to a people that can't stand Paul, right? So he's headed there, and as he's heading there two different times, a prophecy comes. And a prophecy by the Holy Spirit says, uh, Paul, when you go, you're going to suffer. In fact, the last one that makes the prophecy is Agabus. And Agabus says, I'll, I'll read it to you, it's Acts 21, starting in verse 10. It says, several days later, a man named Agabus, who had also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt, and bound his own feet and hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares. Catch this, this is, this is a prophecy by the Holy Spirit. It says, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. He's saying, this is wild, right? This would be like me going to West, give me your belt, taking off his belt, tying up his hands and saying, so shall this happen to you if you do what God has called you to do. 
So listen to Paul's response. When we heard this, uh, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Verse 13, but he said, why all this weeping? You're breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When it was clear that they couldn't persuade him, he gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. Let's go back really quick. Acts 20. Let's go to Acts 22 through Acts 20, 22 through 24. This is Paul being called to go to Jerusalem. Okay. It says, and now I am bound by the spirit to go. So let's, let's put the narrative together, right? Paul is bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. So it says, Paul, and now I'm bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit, there he is again, the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Okay, let's put this together. The Holy Spirit bounds Paul to go to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit tells Paul there will be suffering. The Holy Spirit tells Agabus there will be suffering. And Paul still says, I am willing to go. Why are you upset? It would, it, I would go if I got jailed and it cost me my life. Let me ask you this question. What does that tell you about the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit bound Paul to go to a place where he will experience suffering, what does that tell you about the Holy Spirit? It tells you that there is, there is something by way of the Holy Spirit that when we enter into suffering, it can bring God glory. Something about being willing to suffer for the glory of God and being willing to step into something that may not be ideal, that may not be comfortable, that may not be familiar, that may not fit within your boundary lines of life or within your voting block. To step into something. What was our question again? How do we, how, empowered by the Holy Spirit, how do we become the type of people that minister to culture when they want nothing to do with us? We have to be willing to suffer. How did Paul do it? He was willing to suffer. He was willing to pay the price. And he was willing to pay the price for God's glory. You know, for us, we, uh, we have a child that had, uh, at 18 months, a, a very, very difficult medical diagnosis. Um, and it, it was just a challenge. And, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. It was, it, it still is um, just a super difficult situation. There's a lot of suffering involved with it. There's a lot of challenges involved with it. And we have seen God, she, I don't want to say, well, I already blew it. She's eight. Um, that's my child. And we have seen God do a, a miraculous work in her and has brought her so far. Um, and we pray for her healing. We pray for God to work in her life. But there was a friend of mine who is in the same situation. And I called him one day. I felt led to call him. I called him and I said, hey, um, I want you to know he's got two sons in the same situation. I said, I want you to know I'm praying for your two sons. And I'm praying for my daughter. And I'm praying that they get healed. And he said something to me. I'll never forget it. It made so much sense now. He said, man, I am too. He said, I'm praying for them to get healed too. But he said, let me ask you this question. Would you want to be the man you were before you had her? Would you want to be the man that you were before you had her? And I thought to myself, I mean, the answer is no. Uh, nothing, nothing on this earth has changed my life more than my daughter, right? And I thought the answer is an absolute no, but the reason it's a no is not because of all the answered prayers. It's not because of all the times we celebrated milestones. It's because of the suffering that we went through. It's because of the hard times that we went through. It's because of the tears that we experienced together. 
It's because of the hurt that we walk through when we heard news from a doctor. It's from the challenges that we walked through when we tried to get her into different schools. It, it was just the, the suffering that happened has created a formation in us that can only happen by way of suffering. Maybe the deepest work God wants to do in you is not answering your prayers, but taking you to a deeper place of suffering with him. Maybe he wants to do a work deeper in you through those things so that we can give God glory. So that we can give him glory. How do we become a people who live and do the things of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in a culture that wants nothing to do with us? We're willing to suffer. What is the second thing that happens with Paul? So Paul is willing to suffer. He steps willingly into suffering. He, he goes to Jerusalem. When he arrives in Jerusalem, he shows up there. Uh, he meets with the, the Jerusalem church and the elders of the church. He meets with James and the elders. And he sits down with the elders. And he says to the elders, hey, I've got to tell you about all the great things that God is doing. He shares all the great things that God is doing. And then afterwards, they come to him and they said, hey, Paul, praise God. That sounds really cute. But we need to talk to you about something. We have heard that you are telling Jews that are going to the Gentile church to no longer do the Jewish rituals, to no longer participate in Jewish tradition. And they said, listen, there's a group that's going to hear about this, and when they do, they're going to come for you. And then they come up with a plan. They said, so we've got a plan. We've got a plan to fix you, Paul. We're going to, we're going to get you right. Here's what we need you to do. We need you to participate in a Jewish cleansing ritual so that we can prove to everyone that you are, you are not abandoning our Jewish history, but you are still welcoming it. And, and this, is, this is really interesting. Anytime a Jew came into contact with a Gentile, um, they had to go through a cleansing ritual because Gentiles were unclean. It's like for me, when I go back to Texas, they're going to be like, hey, you got to cleanse. You were in Seattle. You know, no, I'm just kidding. But, there was this cleansing ritual that had to happen, right? And so they say to him, they said, listen, you, you, here's, how we can, here's how you can prove yourself to us. Be willing to do this cleansing ritual. Paul has no obligation to do it. He has no reason to do it. I bet you his flesh didn't want to do it at all. But yet, what does he say? If you look at Acts 21, let's jump down to verse 26. It says, so Paul went to the temple the next day with the other men. They had already started the purification ritual, so he publicly announced the date with their vows that they would end and sacrifices would be offered for each of them. I think this is incredible. Paul didn't have to, but Paul was willing to. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verse 21 through 23? He says, when I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share in their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Paul is saying, my mission in life is to go be among the people, to become them, to win them. How do we become a people that live and do the things of Jesus and impact culture when it wants nothing to do with us? We have to, willing to go, be willing to go and be among them. Have to be willing. That's what Paul did. I, I live in a place that wants to protect our little bubble of holiness, right? And it drives me nuts. It's like, we have bumper stickers that say, don't California my Texas. Like, what are we, what? it's crazy. No, don't, don't celebrate that. It drives me crazy. And I'll tell you why, because we shouldn't be trying to protect our bubble of holiness. We should be going out to spread the goodness of Jesus. Wes, Wes said this to me. I was going to take credit for it, but you, just, you deserve a footnote on this one. He said, maybe this round, post-COVID, Jesus is not as concerned with filling back up our churches as he is with us going out and being among the people and culture. That's what Paul did. It's exactly what Paul did. Paul said, what am I going to do among a group of people that want nothing to do with me? I'll participate in the ritual. 
I'll go into, anyone in here hate running? Anybody? Thank you, my people, I see you, I'm with you. Who likes running in here? Can we just shame them for a minute? Can we shame them for just one second? Listen, I, 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 don't, I don't like to run at all. I've done sprint work before, but nothing, distance running is not my jam, okay? I get to about a mile in and I feel like my head's gonna explode and you know my calves are burning, my lower back's hurting and I, I want nothing to do with it. So I have this neighbor across the street from me and we were both taking our trash out at the same time and he was talking to me and he said, hey, he said, uh, how, how are you doing fitness-wise? You look like you're losing weight. And I'm like, oh, nah, I'm just getting bigger clothes, but it, it's, all, it's all working. And he said, well, hey, he said, here's what I'm thinking. He said, I really need to start working out. Would you, would you mind going running with me? I literally thought in my mind there's nothing I would hate more than to go running with you. <laughs> literally what popped into my mind. I, was, I wanted to be like, no, and, but he knows I'm a pastor. And I'm like, dang it. It's one of, those, one of those Holy Spirit things where I really felt like the Holy Spirit said, go running with this guy. And I have no idea why. I'm like, well, the, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit calls you to suffering, right? So I'm like, okay, I guess, guess I'm going to suffer. So I told him, okay, I will. He said, let's do it 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. I'm like, okay. So I, I don't know what to expect. I get out there at 7 a.m. He, he's, he's literally stretching in my driveway. I'm like, dude, what are we doing? And then he says to me, he says, you know, I haven't really ran since my last marathon. <laughs> what? what? Wait, wait. Say that again? Like, since your last what? Like, I get, I get tired and painful driving 20, however many, 6.2. I've seen the stickers. I get tired driving, right? Let alone running that. So he's like, you know, I figured we'd do four, maybe five if we're feeling good, seven. Like, bro, no, I'm out. But I kept feeling the Holy Spirit saying, run with this guy. Run with this guy. So I tried, and it killed me. I was so sore the next day, I couldn't hardly, you know how you go like two-thirds, and then the last third you just fall? I was like, okay. I just, my legs were so sore I couldn't even stand. Wants to run again. We run again. Wants to run again. We run again. And I'm like, Lord, what are you doing? And then all of a sudden, he has a situation with his daughter. Guess who's had a situation with their daughter? And guess what we get to start talking about? Praying for our children. We get to start talking about ministering to our family. We get to start talking about living out the gospel and praying for our children. And, and I realized at the end of it, God, was, God wanted me to run with him because there was something that I could, we, we could connect on spiritually. Paul was willing to run with people. Are you willing to run with people? Even if you hate running, are you willing? And that's metaphorical, obviously, right? I, 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 right after I witnessed to him, I never ran with him again. Yeah. Praise God, right? I know the assignment, and I know when it's time to go to Jerusalem. I'm out of there, right? I was done with it. But are we willing to run with people? Are we willing to go and be among us? That's what Paul does. Then Paul continues on. As he goes, this is crazy. As he goes to the temple and he participates in the cleansing ritual, these Jews from the part of Asia came down. They found Paul just as the, the Jerusalem church elders told him they would. They find him in the temple. They drag him out of the temple to arrest him. And, and I, think it's, I think it's so ironic to say, and, and they slam the doors of the temple shut behind him, right? Everyone's bailing on Paul. The same people he's doing the cleansing rites with are like, hey, best of luck, and slam the doors shut, right? <laughs> So Paul is now being arrested, and there's this huge commotion that breaks out in the streets because they want to kill him. They're dragging him into the streets to kill him, and as the commotion breaks out and everything starts going crazy, the Roman military hears about it, and a Roman guard comes up. He, he brings his army with him. He brings peace to the streets, and he takes Paul into custody, and he's like, I've got to figure out what is going on with this guy, and it says it went so crazy that as they were carrying Paul up the stairs, in fact, I'll just, I'll read it if I can find it. Let me see. It is 35, 36. 30, 35, 36. Here we go. As Paul preached, as Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent, the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him. And the crowd followed behind him shouting, kill him, kill him. Think about this. This is crazy. This is like you guys all turning on the one Texan in the room, right? You're like, ah, we've had it with Texas. Let's kill him, right? And then all of a sudden, you guys, and Wes is like, no, I gotta save my friend. 
So Wes throws me up over his shoulders. He starts carrying me up the stairs, literally while you guys are chanting, kill that guy, kill that guy, right? And then look at what Paul does. This is, this is where, when we say this, there's so much more than just saying it. There's application to it. How do we become people empowered by the Spirit to love, evangelize, witness to culture when they want nothing to do with us? Look at what Paul does. As Paul was being taken inside, he said to the commander, may I have a word with you? Do you know Greek? The commander asked, surprised. Aren't you the Egyptian who led a rebellion some time ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins out into the desert? Verse 39, Paul says, no, I am a Jew and a citizen of Tarsus of Sicilia, which is an important city. Listen to what he says. Please let me talk to the people. The people who were trying to persecute him was the audience that he loved and had compassion for. The very people that were trying to persecute Paul, Paul is saying, can I talk to him one more time? I can promise you this. If, if you all wanted to kill me tonight and Wes was hauling me up the stairs, I'm not looking at him saying, hey, Wes, can I get one more crack at him? <laughs> can, I, can I give it one more shot? I think I, got a, I think I got a real good backup plan here if you just give me one. But what does Paul do? How do we become the people empowered by the Spirit to love, evangelize, minister to, witness, connect with culture when they want nothing to do with us? We have to be willing to stay with people. We have to be willing to stay with them. We have to be willing that staying power. There is, I think spirit power is staying power. I think when you're empowered by the peer and spirit, you're willing to stick through things that your flesh would otherwise disregard. In fact, what, is, what does God say to Ezra as he's building the temple? He's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. The one thing that's going to keep you going is not your own strength. The one thing that's going to keep you going is not your own comfort. The one thing that's going to keep you going is not your might. It is the Spirit of God. Anybody left something too early before? Anybody left something too early? I'll tell you, I had uh, Royals tickets. A good friend of mine gave me Royals tickets one time. And I, I was in Kansas City. I love the Royals. Born and raised. Uh, I, I grew up in Kansas City and then moved to Texas. Um, so I was at a Royals game, sitting in the Diamond Club, right behind home plate, and there was food, it was beautiful, it was incredible, and the Royals were down 8 to 1 in the bottom of the 8th inning. It's like, all right, I'm out of here. Um, we're done. Let's leave before we beat the crowd. We left, and the next inning, bottom of the ninth, they scored 8 runs and tied it. We're on the highway listening to it on the radio. We're like, can we turn around really quick? Let's turn around and go back and catch it. We, we're going to see. So we tried to turn around. There was a traffic jam to get back in. We couldn't get back in the stadium. The next inning, 10th inning, uh, extra innings, a walk-off home run wins the game. They go to the playoffs. It was a playoff clinching game. We were literally sitting in a car watching fireworks go off and seeing. You could hear the crowd cheering while we're sitting outside of it. I'm like, Wow. Did we screw this one up or what? And then my phone rings. And it's the guy who gave me the tickets. And I answer the phone. And he says, hey, I can hear him screaming. Ah! Did you see that? <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> I mean, like, kind of, you know? And I told, and he said, he said, I never, he said when it's on the line, why would you leave early? Maybe God wants you to stay. Maybe God wants you to stick it out. Even, even if it doesn't seem like there's an end in sight. Maybe if God, until the Spirit says go, stay. That's what Paul did. And then we finish here. I love what Paul did. And I, oh man, I'm over. I got to wrap up. Um, Paul, in the entire chapter of 22, he wraps this up. They arrest Paul. They go to question Paul. And Paul shares with them his story. Paul witnesses to them. He starts sharing with them uh, about his former zeal. He shares an encounter with Jesus. He talks about a temple calling. And then he says, he talks about his mission and what God has called him to do. He, he goes into this space of sharing his story. And if you, if you watch Paul throughout the book of Acts and you, you watch him throughout his letters, he does such an amazing job of sharing his story. Paul has a story to share, and he shares it in a way that's transformative to people. Um, Wes had asked me to share at the end my, my story, and it, it's, listen, it's, 
I was, so I, I was born, my, my dad spent half my adult life in prison, okay? Uh, and we were raised, poor family. I told you that, that story. Um, just no dad around. And I had, this, I had this huge hole in my heart as a young man who didn't have a connection with dad. My dad was uh, in prison, and when he wasn't in prison, he struggled with addiction his entire life until it, until it cost him his life. So I just, I had this huge, rebellious, angry, frustrated void in my heart that I couldn't fill. And then all of a sudden, my mom gave me a cassette tape. Who in here doesn't know what a cassette tape is? <laughs> Who's never seen a cassette tape before? <laughs> who knows what a cassette tape is? Look around. These are people who don't know how to work their iPhones. These are like the old people in the room, right? They, they've used, so I had a cassette tape, and on the cassette tape, it was a message about Jesus fulfilling father to the fatherless and reconciling us to God. And when I heard it, salvation for me was spiritual adoption. I was like, I get this. I understand this. This is the only thing that can satisfy my soul. I've tried everything the world has to offer. Sin doesn't satisfy, it pacifies. The spirit satisfies the soul. So I give my heart to Jesus, right? And, and I become this Turner Burn, radical Christian, trying to reach all my friends, starting Bible studies and, and doing all of these things. And at the same time, I was, I was still hurt. I was still bitter. I, w- I still didn't understand why. I wasn't comfortable sharing my story of dad spending time in prison and me being a, a fatherless kid and, and wandering and this and the other. So I start a church in a town where the capital of the, the, the headquarters of Texas Department of Criminal Justice is. Long story short, I get an email from a chaplain at a prison that said, hey, my daughter goes to your church. Would you be willing to come speak at a prison chapel? And I said, sure, okay. So I went, and when I got there, it was a G4, G5 chapel. So these are all guys who've done hard time. This is capital murder and and everything in between. So uh, I get in there, there's 400 men in the room, and I'm looking around, and these dudes are just hard, hard as rocks, man. I got tattoos all over the face and just strong, ready, he's growling at me, looking at me like, who is, they were, this was the look. What on earth is this guy doing here? Very similar to when he said I was from Texas. You guys looked at me like, what is he doing? But it was this look of like, why is he here, and what is he doing? And I don't know how, but the, the Spirit of God placed in my heart. I, I looked at them, and I said, <laughs> this is not a smart thing to do in prison. I said, I'm not afraid of you guys. I said, I'm not afraid of you guys. And I said, when I see you, I don't see prisoners. I see my dad. And that was the first moment for me where my story made sense. It was the first time for me where I could look back and say, God, I see what you've done now. You may be in a place where your story doesn't make sense. How do we live and become empowered by the Spirit, the people that make a difference in culture when they want nothing to do with us? What does Paul do? He shares his story. Your story may not make sense to you now, but it's only going to begin to make sense when you start sharing it. When you start telling people what God is doing, or how he's working on you, or how he's pushing you. So let's wrap all of this up. How do we become the people who live and do the things that Jesus did, empowered by the Spirit, to make a difference when people want nothing to do with us? One, we're willing to suffer. Two, we're willing to serve. We're willing to be among them. We're willing to to become part of them. Number three, we stay. And number four, we share. We're willing to say. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to be your people in culture, to be your light, to be your witness. Thank you, Lord, that you have empowered us by the Holy Spirit to live and do the things that Jesus did. And I pray you would call us into a deeper move of you. I pray that by the Holy Spirit, you would use us to become a people who make a difference in the world, who see lives changed, who see hearts transformed, who see the world rescued to you. Use us, Lord. Help us to suffer for the glory of God so that we can bring you glory. Help us to serve other people. Help us to stay with people and give us the boldness to share. In Jesus' name, amen.
deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all.